Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome at the session tonight. We are looking forward to a good session uh, about worship. We're going to speak about new dimensions in worship. And as I said to the people attending tonight, that is sort of one of my most favorite uh, topics to speak about. So we're going to start off in the book of Acts chapter 15. And we're going to start reading there from verse 15 onwards. And uh, we're going to trust the Lord to open up some new dimensions tonight uh, uh, on our understanding of worship. All right, so if you've got that verse 15, just uh, that's it. And for us, 17, 15 to 17. 15 to 17. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. And I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. All right, so we're going to speak a bit about this. It's a New Testament scripture. Uh, when we look at the New Testament and we want to know about the biblical pattern for worship, uh, there are some scriptures that we're going to cover tonight. Another one that I want you to go to, let me just find that, is in John 4, 24. Now, John 4 is one of those scriptures that I really, really do enjoy. There's a lot to say, just the whole study, just on, on John chap chapter 4. V very well-known scripture. So, if you've got that one, you can go ahead and read it quickly. John 4, 24. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, what do you understand about if we say we must worship in truth? What do you think that means? Yeah. So, we have to look for a pattern in his word. And from that pattern, we will know we worship in truth. So if we get it in the Word, we look at how they did it in the Word, we apply that, we walk in truth. So Word is the, is the basis from where we do all things, you know. Even when we want to teach about prophecy, even if we want to speak about any other gifts or of the experiences one has, as in the Spirit, you've got to look at scriptural references for all of these things, you know. So the foundation of everything where we think from and operate from must be word oriented. So too is worship. Now, there's scriptures that we'll, we'll speak about a bit later on, you know, that says there, there'll be psalms, there's hymns, there's spiritual songs when we speak about worship. Uh, but this thing really intrigued me the first time I got to just understand it a bit. Uh, what is it that the Bible says is the, the tabernacle of David that will be restored? So we're going to speak a bit about that. So worship in, in truth is understanding word perspective on it. And we're going to look at that even from uh, the, the scripture on the tabernacle of David. Worship in spirit. That, that should be an easy one. It, it is supposed to be spiritual. It's supposed to, to connect you with God. It's supposed to bring you into the presence of Jesus. It's a, it's a spirit to spirit connection. Is that fine if I put it like that? So in, in all uh, of what we see as worship, uh, is, is this, uh, these two things are very big guidelines. So uh, we try to steer away from entertainment, worship. We try to steer away from uh, the show idea of worship. Um, so the, the typical thing nowadays is to make a place dark and put spotlights on and have smoke machines and have all sorts of uh, soulish things, external things, trying to create the, the experience of worship. But the experience of worship is not anything on the outside. It's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connecting. It's a spiritual thing that we're looking for. So we try also to train people not to fall into the trap of professional Worship, but the uh, genuine worship that's that's a different thing eh if if I can put it in a in a in a, in a better way, uh, especially because we focus a lot on prophetic and prophetic flow now if is there any musicians here tonight uh, somebody that plays an instrument all right, so <laughs> if you play an instrument, 
Ja, uh, uh, okay, so he, he weist, daar is iemand. Joshua, can you speel? All right, but you will know that it's a structured sort of a thing, eh? So when you work from the, the sheet music, it's got a specific rhythm, it's got a specific, the, the melody, everything is very specific. And um, I used to play in worship bands my whole life. I actually got saved behind the piano. So, um, and uh, then you would have worship practice sessions on a Thursday, and you would know the whole set list for the Sunday, and you would, you would know the intro to a song, and you would know the middle part, and, and you know, there's a lot of, you practice the whole thing, it's professional, eh? And, and uh, on Sunday morning, uh, you know exactly what's going to happen, and, and it's going to happen that way. And you know, if you come as far as I've come, it's three fast and two slow in the old Pentecostal, you know, sort of churches. And uh, so you already knew the whole, whole sort of way that it would be done. And, and you know, God just comes in and, and He's reforming our understanding of worship. So from a musician's point of view, it can be very polished and perfect if you do all the practicing. But if you want to flow prophetically, it's sort of like jumping into the deep end, eh? And you have to have musicians with you that can flow in the spirit, not on sheet music, you know? And a lot of musicians don't like that because it takes that edge away of the professionalism and they have to now sort of be able to follow if there is a prophetic thing that's happening. And then they're not sure what's the next chord. They have to listen for it. They have to be careful to change and to flow and to move with the, the person that's leading it. But, but it is incredible the result that will come from all of this. And we're going to speak a bit about that different sort of a way, moving away from the entertainment sort of thing and moving into the spiritual understanding, scriptural understanding of it. Eh? So how many of you have got different uh, tastes in music? Who likes jazz? Yeah. Uh, I like a bit of blues, all right? So uh, in the old Pentecostal church, it was sort of a, a, a marriage between country and Burmasek, you know? They jelled, and then you had a specific sound that came out. We always laughed about it. But uh, yeah, we had a, a, a corsentina, I don't know, accordion. And we had a, what do you call it, the pompi? A track lafir and a corsentina. Yeah, so we had both of that when I was young in, in, in worship services. And even at one stage, we had a um with a sah. I don't know if you know those guys. So we had everybody there. And it was quite a hoedown eh? when we had a, had a. But it was good old days. Eh? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 the the runa, you know, banjo, played the banjo as well, with all of those sort of instruments. Uh, yeah, I used to play the Hawaiian guitar uh, in the band when I was younger. So all sorts of things. When we had conference time, every church gave a musician uh, in Namibia. I'm from Namibia. And then we made a joyful noise to the Lord. Eh? But anyhow, church does not cater for your musical taste. You know, if, if we go to listen to a specific style of worship, you know, some will be impressed, some won't. Eh? So you have to enter into this from a spiritual point of view, not a carnal one. And we want to break that carnality and, and move all the things out that can be a carnal thing when it comes to being Worship. Now let's look at the biblical understanding of the tabernacle of David. So in the New Testament it says, in the last days God will raise up the tabernacle of David again. Now just historically, what was the tabernacle of David? So we understand that there was a tabernacle of Moses. How I many of you remember that one? Eh? Now the tabernacle that Moses set up, only once a year, one guy could go into the Holy of Holies. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, and that symbolizes the presence of God, and that's where they could go. Once a year, you could enter one person into that presence of God. And you remember, there was things, he had a rope on. If he, he had sin, he would fall down and die, and they had to pull him out. You know, so it's a, it's a very big thing, uh, going into the presence of God. And then in the history, we see that in a fight with the Philistines, the, the people thought if they could get the Ark of the Covenant into the battle, they might win the battle. 
and the Philistines actually won, and they, they took the, the Ark of the Covenant captive. Many of you know the story. And um, it stayed with the Philistines. And you know that the, it was the ball um, fell on his face when the Ark of the Covenant came in. You know all the stories. And, and then uh, 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 they were punished. And they said, please come and just get this thing. And you come and take this thing. And um, we know the story, what happened. They, they took it to... Uh, a place where the guy's name was Abinab, uh, Abinabdab. Uh, and there it, it stayed for about 20 years. We can read about it in 1 Samuel 4 to, to 7. Uh, and in this time, the whole time, the, the Holy of Holies was empty in the tabernacle, but they still did all the rituals. So Zadok was the high priest. He still did everything over all these years as if the presence of God was still there. But it wasn't. And it stayed at Abinadab's house. And then when David became king, he wanted to get it back. You know the story of uh, Uzzah. They put it on the new, new uh, chariot. And they, he stumbled and he tried to, 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 to keep it from falling. Touched the ark. He died immediately. David realized, okay, problems. They, they, we need to do this in, a, in the right way. 1 Samuel 6 uh, from verse 15 onwards, you can read about that. Or one, uh, uh, 1 Samuel 6 and 1 Samuel 7, those two chapters, you can read it. That. And that was at the house of Ubed Edom, also a Philistine from Gath. And it stayed there for three months. And then David discovered, all right, you will get this ark back to Jerusalem with a lot of sacrifice, offering. So you had to get... Uh, priests, Levites, to go, and they had to carry the ark. Now, it was a heavy thing because it was made of gold, it was plated with gold. And interestingly enough, this is one of the things that Apostle Andre taught us, just when we planted the church, maybe I can give it as a bit of wisdom here as well, is that the Bible says they had to open their shoulders and put the ark's poles on the shoulders. Now, in Afrikaans werk het mooi, uh, when you kerk plant het, you nie toeskouwers nodig nie. Those who will be able to carry the weight of what needs to happen, you know. So uh, it was a sacrificial thing. And then they had to, every seven steps that they took, they had to offer an animal. So you can think it's going to take some time. And there was a lot of blood involved and it took a lot of time. But eventually David got the ark back into Jerusalem. Now, he was supposed to take the ark back to the tabernacle of Moses to put it in the holy place, but he didn't. Uh, on, in Zion, he pitched another tabernacle, and he put the ark of the covenant in there. And this is where the beauty comes about the tabernacle of David, which is now spoken of in the New Testament, that in these the last days, God will restore what they had in the tabernacle of David many centuries before. So, obviously, the tabernacle of David, uh, anybody had access to it. And they had access to it every, you know, whenever they wanted to. It was not restri restricted to just one person, but everybody could go in. And David set up worship in this tabernacle for 24 hours a day for as long as he was king. Isn't that incredible? So there was worship there continuously, day and night, as long as David was king. And that's where he, in the presence of God, wrote many of the Psalms that we have today that we can refer back to. Uh, he went into that place of the presence of God before he went out to war. And he was a warring, warring king, eh? But it's very interesting to read about this and how he set it up. And you can read 1 Chronicles 13 to chapter 16 to see more about it. But he appointed singers and musicians to prophesy on their instruments. Now, this is very, very awesome. 1 Chronicles 25, verse 1 in the Living Bible, it says, David and the officials of the tabernacle appointed men to prophesy to the accompaniment of zitars, harps, and cymbals. This is Old Testament, eh? This is not New Testament. This is Old Testament. And this is the way...
instruments. So there's a prophesying that can happen on the instruments. We're going to speak about that as well. So he pointed enough so that they were in the presence of Jesus, worshipping and prophesying 24 hours a day, 25 weeks a year for all the time that David was king, 1 Chronicles 25. And it said that he set them up. Um, uh, some of them were professionals. Some of them were beginners. Uh, some of them were families that could make music. So a whole house with the children would come. And he set them up hourly. And they, they, they did that hour upon hour upon hour for as long as King, uh, David was king uh, of them. So there were 24 groups of 12 musicians, a total of 288 musicians, who were set apart to provide prophetic worship. And it went on for 30 years. Isn't that incredible? And we get tired from one service and the worship in one service, eh? For 30 years. And, um, and what's incredible for me is that this is way before Jesus. David, David sort of saw things and did things prophetically way before it actually is the time for it. And, and that's where we live. We live in that time now where we have access to God's presence. There's no longer just one oak that can get in because of what Jesus did. It was a prophetic thing that happened and God honored that. And we have that access now to God. And and our worship uh, is something that is is totally um, created uh, and and done for God's pleasure. eh? Not for ours. And and the, the, the... the honoring or the response that we give to God, uh, God's response then is to, to let us uh, uh, inhabit, th- let us uh, experience, let us be in that intimate place with Him and with His presence. Eh? So you see, the focus is always God and God's response, and the response is His glory, His presence, uh, and um, it's a beautiful, a pure, and holy, intimate place, not to be defiled by all our worldly worldly things, eh? So we try to break the whole thing with uh, singing, you know, the top uh, gospel songs, the new hit parade. We try to be genuine. We try to, to, to be in the moment. So what was, what was reformed or what has changed with worship is that we don't come to worship uh, on a Sunday with a plan. So there's no set list. Uh, when I sit down in front of the piano with the worship team, They don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, we do a practice session, setting up for sound and getting everything ready before the service starts. And in that time, we start. I start to scan the spirit, and God works with me with pictures. So, and, and if it's going to be prophetic and it's going to be profound, I need to see what God wants to do. So. God will start with me with a, a picture or a, or a topic. So I would know this morning it'll be all about repentance. And then there are songs that I know that will connect to repentance. And then when I get to a place where there's no longer a song that I can connect to this sort of, sort of a flow, then I've got to trust the Lord and I've got to sing from the Spirit a new song. So it challenges us to move in a totally different sort of perspective or a different sort of a way. So, sadly, in the biblical times, when David passed away, Solomon built the temple, put the ark back in the temple, and they went back to the old way of doing it, you know? Only one person, once a year, and it got lost until now in the New Testament in Acts, where it's proclaimed, for these will be the ways we'll worship in the last days. We are living in the last days. It's the day between Jesus who ascended and Jesus who's coming back. That is the last days. Now, afterwards, you'll have to be here for to hear this. I heard a theory that Jesus is coming on Pentecost Day. So that's the 18th of May. Is it right? Mark your saag, reich broer, is nabe. But anyhow, <laughs> just for a side note, but we're in those end time sort of place. All right. In Amos 9.11, we find the same prophetic word, and you can go read it again. It's again that in these the last days, God will rebuild the fallen house or the tabernacle of David. Now, it does refer to the new church. 
We are the new Israel, eh? We are the new church. God will rebuild His people. That's us. We are those who... And that's true. Exactly that's what happens. But if we look at what happened in the tabernacle, that is also very important. Uh, will you, Ilana, just find that scripture for me, that while the first tabernacle is still standing, now this is very important, you cannot enter into the new, what God has for us, if the first tabernacle is still standing. So what happened there? The first, Moses' tabernacle was still there. David did the new one, but they were unable to carry on with the new because the old was still standing. And there's actually scripture in the, in the book of Hebrews where he speaks about this. Eh? That God has made for us a new and a living way, but we cannot get into this new and living way uh, uh, unless... There is no longer an old tabernacle standing. We have to, to get out of the old mindset and way of doing things to progress into what God has for us in the new. So again, if I go back to the three fast, too slow, is it took us time. The mentality was you have to work yourself into the presence of God. Eh? So you've got to earn your way, put it like that. And then you know that you've got to do this, you've got to do this, and I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. You have this whole process-driven sort of idea, which is actually a very legalistic sort of way to look at it. But I want to say to you, if you understand the deliverer or the, the liberty, let's put it like that, is that, and I've experienced it, guys, if I put my hand to the piano in that moment, heaven is there. It's not a process. It is incredible. Whether it's a joyous song, whether it's a, it's a, it's a deep worship song, you just, whew, the presence of Jesus, the glory of God is there. Eh? On Sunday, I had an incredible experience in our worship. Now, for, for a, a, a whole lot of time, especially during COVID, I heard a, a, a sound of a trumpet, but I knew it was spiritual. It was never physical. It was spiritual. So I knew it was spiritual, and I heard it while I was singing, and it was beautiful. On Sunday, I actually heard voices with us, because, uh, I don't know, it was just another dimension. I heard some, some beautiful tones and voices, and we were actually a, a smaller group singing than usual. And at one point... I heard a, a shofar blowing, and it was for me, not spiritual, but in the natural, that I stopped the service and asked who, who blew, because I wanted to explain what, what do you do when someone blows a shofar. It is an announcement. So it's not, the, the shofar was never used for worship. It is to announce something. So if there's a, a, a shofar blown, we need to stop and say, okay, what is it that God wants to announce now? What did we just sing prophetically? This is an announcement. It's a decree by the Spirit. Let's agree with the announcement. Blow it again. You know? So I want to do that. And there's nobody that blew the... And I was dumbstruck. Never mind, because I was convinced someone in the crowd had a ram's horn. It stirred me tremendously. But God's presence, the holiness of God, is something that is supposed to be, it's a new and a living way. It's an easy way through Jesus Christ. It's not an earning it. You don't have to press for it. Uh, just read that scripture. Hebrews 9, verse 8 to 10, it says the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle, tabernacle was still standing. Just stop there. The way into the holiest of all, not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle is still standing. It's true for the Old Testament, eh? now as well, yeah? It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Sure. So Reformation is here to reform us so that we could get out of the symbolic stuff into the reality of things. Isn't that good? But the way into this presence can never be entered until we say goodbye to the old way, the old tabernacle. So we've got to step away from the performance thing 
the washing of hands, the nice songs, the nice music, all the things that we've learned so many times in the charismatic. Stop having the lights and the shows and all the stars. And the, We need to get to that place where it is all about just Him, not about the fleshly things and fleshly ordinances as the Bible speaks about. And then there's an access to the Holy of Holies in a beautiful and a wonderful way. Eh? And incredible things. We really, uh, you've been there once maybe when we had a, a full service, many of you guys. But it's incredible the last few Sundays what the Lord, not in the last few, it's been the last year, last year and a half, what's happened in our worship. It is just another world. And uh, God has opened up these, these places of, of where true worshipers can really enter in and really can have um, an experience with this wonderful living God of ours. And then in that place, there are psalms, there's hymns, there's spiritual songs. Spiritual songs, something like singing in tongues. There's a new song. It's a new song of the Lord. It's something that's created in the moment and it's a flow in the moment. So you'll see that when you come to us, we've got a, a, a person at the board at the back. So some of the songs that are known songs you'll find on top. And then when there is a prophetic flow or a flow starts, they start to type out what was si what's singing, what's busy being sung, uh, because it's not, a, it's not on the a song list. And then you can't necessarily sing along, but then you're supposed to look up and follow and hear what the Lord sings because it becomes prophetic. And if it's a refrain, you can start to sing the refrain with, to sort of earth it in your spirit. But there's, we call it scribing. It's the same thing that when somebody gives you a prophetic word, you've got somebody writing it down, giving you the word. So we've got scribes appointed in the church that if there's a prophecy, someone will come write it down and give it to you after the service or just after say, this is what the Lord said to you. Because we don't want to lose the prophetic intent that's happening in the services. And every service is scribed, it's saved, and if you want the prophetic flow of that meeting, we mail it to you. And you can go through what the Lord did and what the Lord said in that service. And we encourage the people to have a little notebook in your pocket. So during the worship, while you're worshiping, and we expect it to be prophetic, so it's not just only us to God, but God to us, and God starts to speak through the prophetic. Take your little book, write down, God is saying the following to me. He'll give you word from the prophetic flow. So you'll see sometimes when you're there, people will worship and they suddenly they get a book and they start to write down what the Lord is showing to them. Close the book, put it back and go into worship and continue. That's wonderful because that's what we, God is reforming the way of prophecy as well, right? Eh? Prophecy is no longer just standing in the queues and people coming to you and you sort of shotgun prophesying for each one. God's reforming all things. Amen. And I believe we're in a, in a time of major reformation. And there's wonderful new spiritscapes, landscapes, spiritscapes to discover in the Lord if we just would allow time and allow people to just step in to what God has for us. Eh? So, um, so we encourage that sort of thing, the scribing, so that there would be a flow. People can see and can read. They can connect with that. And for that moment, you, you don't have to sing along, but then when you understand and you've got it, you can flow again and you can sing with it. What an incredible thing. Now, secondly, also with David, David was, was the, he wanted to build the temple, but he couldn't because God didn't want him to do it. 1 Corinthians or Chronicles 28 verse 3, it says there, But God said to, to David, to me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and have shed blood. So God didn't allow him to build the temple. His son had to do it. But he was a man of war. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a rebuilding of prophetic warfare worship. Not only prophetic worship, but warfare worship. And, and we see this happen in the David tabernacle as well. Now, what do I mean by prophetic warfare worship? I'm going to try to be as practical as possible. We have found one Sunday, the Lord started to speak to us about, I think it was Uganda. Was it Uganda? And... Uh, I started to sing about Uganda. Now, it's very irritating if you wanted to have just a nice song, you know. 
En hier kom je over die sange en hy begin sing oor Uganda. Lord, bless the nation of Uganda. We pray that uh, in the nation of Uganda there will be breakthroughs. And we started to prophesy and declare things over Uganda. People started to pray for Uganda. We spent about a half an hour just on Uganda. Done and settled and we flowed on. After the service, we got a phone call. Miami got a phone call from Prophet Nola and said, Listen, you won't believe Andre was in Uganda that morning, preaching at a place, and they tried to come and um, kidnap him for ransom. But the Holy Spirit warned him in the service. Now, this is the type of man Apostle Andre was. So, during a service, they're still singing, he still had to preach. The Holy Spirit said to him, he needs to go. He went to the pastor and said to him, listen, the Holy Spirit said, I need to go. I need to go. The pastor didn't want to take him, so he talked so much to anybody around him, and there was one guy that said, okay, he'll take him. And they went, and about 15, 20 minutes later, they arrived with the AK-47s in this village, knowing that he was there. There was actually shots fired, but he was gone already by that time. Now, that morning, we were making warfare through our worship. Did not know he was in Uganda. We had no idea what was happening in Uganda. But we were praising, worshipping, making decrees over the nation of Uganda. Then by that night time, that guy that took him away, got him to the, the king of that uh, province and the house of that king. Now that guy, we sort of have a good relationship with his son. He passed away in the meantime. He's now the new king of that area. And um, we always, uh, at one stage, you know, the girls, the prince is coming to preach, you know. So, uh, but he's really a king, really a prince. And uh, so got to his dad. Andre took uh, sort of like a, a sort of a, a shelter there. His dad, because you were a king, you become part of the parliament of, of Uganda, opened the door, and that night he was on radio preaching for the whole nation of Uganda. Isn't that incredible how God just... But then you enter into a place of worship becoming a tool that God uses to break open things, and it's not just a nice song you sing to have a nice experience. You, you would not know how many times, because close to where we're at is the St. George's Hotel. We started our ministry uh, in that chapel, and the ANC would have their meetings there, you know, their general, I don't know what they call it, the meetings. And then we would worship, and that Sunday, yuck, it would go into the, the, the South Africa. We would start to address things in the Spirit and pray about our nation and pray about our government. And then the afternoon in the news, they met up in St. George's Chapel, just a, a little bit a small ways from where we were worshiping, you know. So there's power in prophetic warfare type worship. Some mornings when we come to church, uh, I would know right from the beginning we have to break open things this morning. And then it's not going to be just a song we sing. Then uh, there'll be shouts and there'll be, there'll be uh, um, uh, exuberant praise until we get to that place where, the, where it lifts, where things open up in the Spirit. There's some Greek words that we will get to one day in Bible studies that speak about the things uh, that worship is supposed to be all about. But one of them would be to be clamor clam clamorously foolish before the Lord. Eh? And um, in those moments where we just get the people to start to stand up and they understand the, the authority of a shout in the Spirit, and we do clamor uh, say again, Foolish worship, glamorously foolish worship. We get them to dance and we celebrate before the Lord. Then suddenly you will just see in the people a lift. And when the lift comes, it's not only for the people there, it's for your communities, for your city. So the way that God showed us in Pierre van Reinefeld specifically about the worship is we've got uh, the Waterkloof Air Force Base. And uh, there's an air traffic control tower. So God said to us that first year when we planted, this church will be like an air traffic control tower. We'll regulate sp spiritual traffic in and through our, our city, uh, actually Pretoria. Eh? So we've seen that. But then it's a different dimension of worship. It's a different, uh, it's not just a song you sing. It's not just something nice you do. 
you come ready to enter in. And those of you who've been at our church, you'll see the people come and they're ready. And sometimes while we're practicing, they will pick up, the people will already pick up theirs a flow. And then they will come to the front without us even uh, asking them to come. And some of them will start to enter in and start to worship and make warfare. That's very, very, very important to note as well. All right, so I'm not going to go further into all of that. If we, if we speak about this type of worship, as I said, um, in your notes you'll find the scriptures that will bring you to some of these, these, um, these uh, things that I said, Barak, the praise words, a shout, and all of these things. Uh, how do you enter in? Number one, it's by faith and not by feeling. So you don't come to the front feeling I want to go to the front. So it's a faith act. It's an act of faith. So worship, even when I go sit there, it's an act of faith. It's not an act of feeling. I don't go by my feelings. Some days you are tired. You've had a long week. Some days you get there. It was a, a difficult journey to the church. I don't know if you've got small kids or whatever. But when you get there, you have to enter in by faith. I'm going to do this by faith. Now the shift comes in your mind when you understand that corporate worship is different than individual worship. So I always say to the people, if you want to be alone with God, be alone with God when you're alone. Can I say that again? If you want to be alone with God, be alone with God when you're alone. But when we come together, let's together establish something in the Spirit. That is powerful. So I add my worship. I join my worship with your worship. You get the difference? So even if I do not feel like it, I am now here and I enter in by faith so that we together can establish something in the spirit over our community, our city, or our nation. You see the difference? And then you'll see, once you align yourself and this corporate worship happens, the experiences will come. But you don't go for the experience, you go for the, the work of worship. Is that good if I put it like that? So you have a mindset, I participate in the worship. I, I, I worship with. So you'll find it in the Old Testament as well. Uh, we've got a dance leader or a worship leader. Uh, and a worship leader. The worship leader is the guy on the piano or the guitar or something in front. But then you've got somebody that, that leads the, the movement in the church. So there's something that the Lord spoke to us about many, many moons ago. And I'll give you that um, word that the Lord gave Harvester. It said, God is looking and waiting for a people who are set apart to take hold of the supernatural, to bring it into the now of God, to the body by dancing and forcefully and aggressively uh, dancing it into existence. So uh, you'll see that there's people that, that's in front. So, and there's many of them. There's not only one or two, but there's usually two. And the worship leader with those in the movement, they, they sort of look at each other, flow with one another. And it's incredible. Sometimes the way they move will determine where I go with the song. And where I go with the song determine how they will do prophetic actions. And everybody join in unity with them. Miriam led the people in dance and they all in the Jewish way followed the way that she danced. So we've got this way that the Lord has showed us that without even props, we do it corporately. So everybody does it. So you can be in the, in the, in the, in the chairs and you can be in front, but corporately we are breaking down strongholds and then we sort of show how we're breaking down the strongholds. And while we're singing about breaking down strongholds, you are showing, I'm breaking down a stronghold. And it's nice if you have a man, because the man has got more manly moves than the girls. Uh, and so the guys look at Tony sometimes, and, and they follow Tony, and the girls look at Mimi or at uh, uh, Amelia, or who's leading it that day. And then we follow that. 
But we try to connect because there's a correlation between the prophecy and an action in the Spirit. So when David had to, to stand in front of the, only David, only Moses had to stand in front of the, the ocean, he had to take his rod, and, and there's a corresponding action in the Spirit. In the same way, there's a corresponding action when you put not only your voice on the line, but your body on the line. <laughs> Is it good if I put it like that? So it's actually not dance, it's more movement, but we are doing it corporately, and we're seeing ourselves as an army unit before the Lord. And today's worship will establish and accomplish things. And you won't believe the, the testimonies that comes out of this way of worship. Where, where somebody, and that's what I'm saying, sometimes you don't even feel like it, but you're stepping up in front and you're doing the movement, and as person in the, in the pew see that movement, they hear the song, and they receive by faith, and God brings a release and a breakthrough for, for them. So it's not only just for you. You worship as a unit, and God starts to do things in that, that corporate unit way, unity way of worship. Guys, it's powerful. It's powerful. One Sunday morning, um, I had a very stubborn member at that stage, and she gave me lots of prayer pointers. And um, uh, that Sunday, uh, holy moments, uh, but before those moments come, she never wanted to enter in always, and we never force anybody to do, this is something we train you in, you have to build your faith for it, and then you go for it. And that Sunday, she decided, okay, she, she was struggling with a tremendous backache. And she said, she, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this now in obedience, not in feeling, but in obedience. And she stepped out, and just as she came to the front, it changed, and, and people started to spontaneously just lay before the Lord. Ne? Now she's thinking, oh my word, my rug, and now I'm going to And uh, she obeyed. <laughs> in obedience, she did it. And she said when she touched the floor, and we've got a cold floor, when she touched the floor... It was like a hot flame in her back. God healed her back immediately just because of the, the place of obedience in that moment of the presence of God. I want to introduce you to a new way of worship, a new way of understanding worship, a way that you can enter in that is a corporate way. It's more than just a nice song we sing. Eh? It takes humility. Uh, faith, it takes humility, uh, it, it's going to take a bit of guts, but you know what, if everybody does it, you're going to be the only one not doing it, so that's sort of the place where we're at in our church at the moment. And um, the big thing is that you would step out of, of that individualistic sort of way, start to understand the power of the corporate way of worship. Is there something that you might just want to add? Just give her the mic there, because she's been worshipping with me forever. Hello. Okay. So um, you read out of 1 Chronicles 25, but the first two verses there, it says, David, together with the commanders of the army, set apart some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. So Asaph means unity, Heman means faithful, and Jeduthun means flow like oil. And those are three very important elements worship. when we worship. Um, the flow like oil speaks for itself. Um, it's faithful men and women. Yep. The Lord works through faithful men and women. And then I want to get to the unity. So Carl was speaking about the corporate anointing when we worship. Um, when we add our weight together with one another, we can do more. So that means we have to lay down our own agendas for the day, uh, what we would like God to do today, the plans we, will, we might have, and together we enter into worship and the Lord will do what needs doing because he knows better than us through the unity that is established um, with, with us, in us. Awesome. Now, so we all used props at one stage. I see you guys have flags as well. That's wonderful. Uh, there's beautiful things you can do with the flags. But, you know, we, we sort of left all those things behind for the sake to get everybody to do it. So there was a time where we had, you know, these ladies with the white uh, gowns. And then they would come and they would do a, a dance in front, a prophetic dance. Beautiful, but we want to break the spectating thing. Because we want to create the unity thing. So what happened, it was beautiful, but it was, again, you sitting back and we're spectating. 
So one of the ways that we broke these these things is we uh, we have a, a big space in our our tent where there's space to move and dance. But at one time we had to take some of the chairs out. When people came to the service on the Sunday, there's no place to sit. We said, okay, today we're going to move. And we're going to do the movement. And you're going to look at this person. You're going to flow with this person. Eh? We made a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes. You know, uh, boards with spelling mistakes. And we still have that. But it's the heart that matters. Eh? It's to get us into that place where we really come as a unit before the Lord. We press in into that space and that place of the holiness. And we allow God in that moment to speak to us. And we corresponded. We speak again to Him. And we hear prophetically, not for just ourselves, but for, for the congregation, for the nation, for the nations. And that's an incredible place to be at. I think it's also important, um, if you think of an army, um, if you change your perspective of church, let's start there. So at the moment or sometimes we think when we come to church um okay we get to know um, i get to know amelia a bit better uh, maybe there's a moment where i can pray for amelia afterwards we have a nice chat and we learn something about the lord in in church but church is much more than that church is a spiritual gathering of saints so it's like an army coming together an army doesn't come together just to cook and tear yeah they come together to do something significant. So if you are part of that army, if you're part of Harvest Separatoria, you are part of the significant thing that needs to happen this Sunday. So that will also propel you not to just stay at home. Because you understand that I've got a function and I've got a purpose um, in the gathering. And then when you get to the gathering, you submit to what happens in the gathering so that what needs to happen can happen. So submission, the Greek word for it is hypotasso. So that means to go under. Eh? I always remember it. I, I think of a, a hippo, you know, going under, coming up, going under. Going under means to say, have your way, Lord, have your way. So to do that, that means whatever my idea was for today, I surrender because Lord today you want to do something in Uganda and I am part of the army that needs to do that today yeah so it's moving away again from that feel-good idea to really being effective in the spirit yeah you, you're gonna get there <laughs> you're gonna get there um, in closing we, we really speak and uh, we emphasize the firefold the firefold ministries but worship should be like that. There should be an apostolic sound, apostolic prophetic decrees. There should be a moment of intimacy and pastoral sort of connection with God. Some of the songs we sing will train you. There's a lovely song we sing. You can't hurry God. No, no, no. You just have to wait. You got to trust Him and give Him time. No matter how long it takes. He's a God you just can't hurry. Brother, don't you worry, he's, he may not come when you want him to, but he'll be right on time. Isn't that a, a nice, Krayom Shumo Subiki, a good training session in, eh? <laughs> so, you, you've got to have all of these aspects in it. I want you to start to break the idea of Jesus, my boyfriend. <laughs> You heard me right. Break the idea of Jesus, my boyfriend. Now that sounds a bit weird, but you know, people have made worship just this one dimensional thing that is supposed to be between the, the intimacy between you and God. I, I'm saying that in a way that it makes a bit sense and it, it hits home. We need to break that because it's not only your brother, your friend. He's also your Lord. He's the one with all authority. He, the Bible says He rules and He reigns through worship. He, he makes His seat of authority in the moment that you worship. Go read that scriptures. Go test me in this. And God rules and reigns from that place of worship. The church is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. And God decrees things into existence 
things are shifted and moved. Destinies of places and, and cities and nations are established through accurate prophetic apostolic worship. So it's a different dimension. And start to embrace that. Start to look for that. Start to pray for that. Start to look for the musicians that will be able to move in that sort of a way. And boy, oh boy, worship will be something completely different.